HMS King George V, the lead ship of the most modern British battleships commissioned during World War II, was the pride of the Royal Navy. Displacing over 42,000 tons with a length of 745 feet and armed with a main battery of 10 14-inch guns, she was a force to be reckoned with. As the jewel of the crown, HMS King George V was dormant when the Kriegsmarine unleashed its lethal commerce raiding campaign across the North Sea in the Atlantic. The Royal Navy did not want the battleship to be sunk by enemy submarines. However, the sinking of HMS Hood by the fearsome battleship Bismarck was more than enough to awaken King George V from her sleep for one specific mission, vengeance. Despite being smaller and brandishing a battery of 14-inch guns against Bismarck's 15-inch guns, HMS King George V was still more than capable of barraging the Germans with lethal firepower, and in May 1941, the British battleship left safe harbor, determined to put an end to Bismarck's year-and-a-half-long reign of dominance once and for all. Little did her crew know, Prime Minister Winston Churchill had just issued a radical decree to the British Navy. Bismarck must be sunk, even if it meant sacrificing King George V. Amidst escalating global tensions and even stricter treaty limitations, the Royal Navy embarked on the ambitious creation of the King George V class, an endeavor to maintain naval supremacy through innovation and modernization. The first and namesake of the class was launched in the spring of 1939, with a displacement of 36,000 tons, armed with 10 14-inch guns placed in dual and quad turrets, in a blend of firepower, armor, and speed, made to make a stand against the trends of the emerging Axis powers. While these innovative quad turrets, housing her main guns, were sometimes prone to mechanical issues, her advantages were clear despite these hurdles. Her agility on the high seas allowed for tactical maneuvering to outpace and outmaneuver opponents. Depending on the mission, about 1,500 sailors and officers called her decks home, working in unison. Following fitting out in sea trials, George V was commissioned into the Royal Navy in early October 1940 and was assigned to the home fleet at Scapa Flow. Throughout early 1941, George V crossed the Atlantic in various missions, like ferrying Foreign Secretary Lord Halifax to American shores, and as a shield during Operation Claymore, a daring British commando raid targeting the Lofoten Islands off the coast of Norway, aiming to destroy fish oil factories and other installations vital to the German war effort, boosting morale among the resistance and the British public. In March, she was one of the many Royal Navy ships that hunted in the icy Atlantic waters, looking for U-boats and seeking the shadows of the dangerous Scharnhorst-class battleships. But King George V was destined for something far greater than convoy escort missions. That same month, after a lucky streak, King George V became the flagship of the Royal Navy's home fleet, becoming a cornerstone of North Atlantic operations protecting the Arctic convoys. With this promotion came the arrival of Admiral Sir John Tovey, the Commander-in-Chief of the Home Fleet. A diligent know-it-all of naval strategy and tactics, Tovey was always prepared for any situation with a calm face. He was also deeply respected for his integrity, courage, and leadership. Tovey valued initiative and detested micromanaging his men. He maintained high standards without unnecessary strictness on appearance, fostering a solid camaraderie amongst his men. At the time of the promotion, after barely succeeding in the Battle of Britain, UK war planners and politicians alike realized they were now isolated and facing immense difficulties ahead. On the other side of the fight, after failing to invade Britain through land, Germany switched its strategy and was now trying to starve an entire nation by cutting off the lifelines that connected the island country with the rest of the world. Now, they were in the midst of a new battle just as fierce, this time in the Atlantic waters. Prime Minister Churchill, who was the first to christen the conflict as the Battle of the Atlantic, later wrote that, quote, Amid the torrent of violent events, one anxiety reigns supreme. Dominating all our power to carry on the war, or even keep ourselves alive, lay mastery of the ocean routes and the free approach and entry to our ports. So in May 1941, when news reached the Admiralty that the most feared Kriegsmarine vessel was near England, the Royal Navy had no time to lose and come up with a plan to bring victory back to the United Kingdom. By that spring, after over a year and a half of war, the Kriegsmarine battleship Bismarck was regarded as the world's most powerful, largest, fastest, and most protected warship. 
with thick layers of steel armor encasing her decks, hull, turrets, engine rooms, and magazines. The Germans often declared this fearsome class of battleships unsinkable. At the time, the ship was commanded by Admiral Gunther Lückjens, a battle-hardened, no-nonsense man whose hard face seldom broke into a smile. Embarking from Gottenhafen port on May 18, 1941, Bismarck, accompanied by heavy cruiser Prince Eugen, ventured into the Atlantic, ready to disrupt Allied shipping, when, unbeknownst to the duo, they were spotted by a Swedish cruiser and later confirmed by aerial reconnaissance. With this, Admiral Tubby, aboard HMS King George V, alongside HMS Prince of Wales, HMS Hood, and others, quickly set sail from Scapa Flow to intercept. The group's commanders knew that, while a grave threat, it was a great opportunity. Sinking the German battleship would be a magnificent naval victory and much needed good news after months of disappointments. On the morning of May 24th, the Axis and Royal Navy ships clashed in the Denmark Strait in a fast yet brutal battle. Without warning, Bismarck's guns, ever powerful and precise, erupted in a fiery maelstrom. A shell found its mark within HMS Hood's magazine, and in a harrowing explosion, the ship was torn apart. From Hood's original crew of 1,418, only three survived. With this enormous loss, the hunt was more important than ever. Soon, HMS King George V was at the helm of a vengeful pursuit to once and for all get rid of the Kriegsmarine sea monster. With decades of experience, Admiral Tubby received the urgent call to action. But with the specter of U-boats also lurking beneath the waves, a palpable tension settled over the deck. The crew was undoubtedly nervous, but understanding the gravity of their mission, to hunt down the mightiest ship that threatened their lifelines. The leader ordered the engines to life, and the vessel sailed forth into the churning waters. Right after destroying HMS Hood, Bismarck and her crew escaped into the open sea, heading for Brest in German-occupied France for repairs as fast as possible. However, before any of this could happen, in a stroke of luck, an aircraft spotted her floating along the icy Arctic waters. That same night, a fairy swordfish from HMS Ark Royal released an ammunition charge, hitting right through Bismarck's steering gear. The most feared ship in the world was now unable to move freely. Bismarck's fate was sealed. Throughout the night, as she limped along the waves, the hunter became the hunted. She was subjected to repeated torpedo attacks from fast Royal Navy destroyers, which had now caught up. Unknowingly, Bismarck was now heading straight toward the battleship King George V, approaching from the north. Aboard the flagship of the home fleet, the crew members of King George V knew it was only a matter of time before they faced off with the crippled yet still strong German battleship. The King George V-class ships were notably lighter, nearly 12% less in weight compared to their German equivalents. But there was another critical element. In the chase to sink the elusive Kriegsmarine ship, HMS King George V and other pursuing British ships were running critically low on fuel. With King George V's fuel bunkers draining fast, if they ran dry, the flagship would be dead in the water, and most importantly, at the mercy of any prowling U-boat. Knowing that this risked their ability to continue the operation, Tuffy was pondering the idea of breaking off the chase. However, upon receiving the news that King George might have to turn for home before sinking Bismarck, Churchill's response, passed on by Admiral Sir Dudley Pound, chief of the naval staff, was resolute that, quote, Bismarck must be sunk at all costs, and if to do this it is necessary for the King George V to remain on scene, then she must do this, even if it subsequently means towing King George V. But Tubby was unaware of this response just yet, and despite being low on fuel, in the early morning of May 27th, King George V, accompanied by the HMS Rodney battleship, closed in for the kill. At 8.47 a.m., Rodney opened fire upon the legendary Kriegsmarine ship, with King George V following only one minute later. It took around an hour of endless pounding for the two British battleships and heavy cruiser Dorsetshire before Bismarck's big guns finally stopped firing. The German battleship was nearly gone, and Captain Lutyens was lost following a shell from King George V that hit the bridge. Finally, HMS Dorsetshire closed within a thousand yards and got ready to perform the coup de grace. After two 21-inch charges left the cruiser's tubes, a tremendous explosion erupted within the ship. At 10.39 a.m., 
400 miles from Brest, France, the Bismarck battleship, once the Battle of the Atlantic's most feared asset, sank beneath the waves, taking down over 2,000 men with her. In his typical fashion, Prime Minister Winston Churchill broke the news to the nation in dramatic fashion at the House of Commons. The relief in London, and an entire country that desperately needed a win, was immense. But Churchill's desperation for sinking the Bismarck, even if it cost the Royal Navy the King George V battleship, came with a price. While the message was not received until after Bismarck was sunk, Tubby, after asserting that he would have ignored this anyway, also described the Prime Minister's decision as, quote, the stupidest and most ill-considered signal ever made. This exchange only deepened the already existing mistrust between the two men. Following the intense operation that led to the sinking of Bismarck in late May and repairs and adjustments to her guns, King George V resumed attacks on German shipping in the Glom Fjord in Norway that fall, followed by providing cover to convoys to beleaguered Russia. Nearly a year after the sinking of the Bismarck, while acting as escort, King George V collided with the destroyer HMS Punjabi, sinking her and badly damaging her own bow. This incident led to her being taken out of service for nearly the rest of the year, and she resumed duties on December 18th. From then until the following May, HMS King George V transitioned from her role in the Arctic to a significant player in the Mediterranean theater. After heading towards Gibraltar in preparation for Operation Husky or the Battle of Sicily in May 1943, King George V and her sister ship, HMS Howe, played a pivotal role in the reserve covering group with the thunderous guns bombarding the area that following July, providing crucial support. Once the Allies launched Operation Avalanche, the massive invasion of the Italian mainland, King George V and Howe further cemented their role as guardians of Allied interests in the region, supporting the push toward victory. As the war in the Pacific reached a boiling point, HMS King George V was called in to serve far from the familiar waters of the Atlantic and the Mediterranean embarking on a new journey in the closing chapters of World War II. Following yet another overhaul, where King George V was equipped with the latest radar technology and even more anti-aircraft guns, she set sail from Scapa Flow in October 1944, reassigned as the flagship of the newly established British Pacific Fleet's second-in-command, Rear Admiral Sir Bernard Rawlings. While she and her sister ship, HMS Howe, had a much reduced role compared with the North Atlantic campaign, they were still instrumental in the theater. As 1945 dawned, HMS King George V launched a series of strikes against airfields in the Sakishima Gunto and later the Ryukyu Islands. Her guns, thundering in unison with her allied counterparts, destroyed Japanese air facilities and industrial installations. The bombardment of Hitachi and later Hamamatsu marked a relentless pursuit of victory. In the campaign for Okinawa in March, HMS King George V supported the fast carriers of the British Pacific Fleet, proving to be an indispensable asset in the Allies' arsenal. Her last offensive action was in southern Honshu, where King George V last fired her main armament in anger. As the war drew to a close, with the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki ushering in the end of the conflict, HMS King George V sailed into Tokyo Bay, where she was a silent witness to the surrender of the final Axis power. As peace settled over the world, the once great battleships of the King George V class, including the venerable HMS King George V herself, faced a new reality. With the cost of maintaining such a colossal vessel now unsustainable, she was scrapped in 1957.